Not many teams, Bobby, are on for the treble. Back in 80-81, Ipswich Town were never so close. Yes, we did, and we didn't perhaps have the, the large stuff that Manchester United had uh, last year. So we were working on a, you know, a smaller group of players, so it was a, perhaps a bit more taxing. But we had a very good team. Um, a lot of individual technique and skill within all the players. And um, I think the answer was that we, we found a system to suit every single player. In, in, in the squad or in the team. Hello and welcome to this special show to celebrate the 40th anniversary of Ipswich Town winning the UEFA Cup, the boys of 81. And it's a special honour to have joining us today one of the heroes from that game, one of the boys of 81, Russell Osman, a football hero and movie star from that epic movie, Escape to Victory. Thank you yeah, so about much. 40 to... years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much for giving us your time today, Russell. And also special thanks to Malcolm Thompson, who's the uh, organiser of the Kevin Beatty Foundation. And he's raising money with a fortnight's worth of fundraising for the Sir Bobby Robson Foundation. Thanks, Malcolm, for organising this today and for joining us. But I'd like to start, Russell, with you. What was it like to be a member of the Boys of 81? What are your overriding memories of that fantastic team? It was more like going to work with your best mates every day. So it never really felt like work. It was just what we did. We all enjoyed playing football in those days. We had a great side. We were winning the majority of games that we played. And to do it with uh, lads that you either grew up with um, in the academy or people that you've been playing with for a while, like I say, it didn't feel like work. It was just like going in every day to have a kick about football. It was great stuff. That's absolutely brilliant. Football's changed a lot. Uh, but what, one thing that hasn't changed is the fans. And we've got a great fan here, Malcolm, who does a lot of work behind the scenes. Tell us, Malcolm, what are you doing to, uh, to honour the, uh, the boys of 81 with, with your fundraising? Tell us all about that. Kerry was a great friend of mine. And so when he passed away, sadly, I decided to raise a foundation in his name. And now we decided, because it's the 40th year of the 1981 winning side, we decided to celebrate having a 40th anniversary raffle and to raise money for the uh, Sir Bobby Robson Foundation. Obviously, Sir Bobby was the manager who led its reach to uh, the famous glory in Europe. So that's what we're asking for to do now is to, is to uh, buy some tickets off us. And we've got over 30 Ipswich Town prizes and we're doing, you know, daily draws. The first draw is on the 6th of May and that's because that was the date of the first leg of the final. Uh, and then we're doing daily draws ending on the 20th of May, which was the second leg of the final. So hopefully we'll raise enough money to, uh, you know, for the Boy Robson Foundation. That's absolutely brilliant, Malcolm. OK, Russell. Uh, yes. What I want to do is show you some clips from the film, The Boys of 81, which uh, we made to celebrate your, your fantastic season. We're not going to go through the whole season, but I'm going to mention, we're going to talk about some of the games that led up to the, uh, to the, to the final. I just want to start off by playing a little clip of Bobby Robson because I know you've played in quite a few teams under Bobby Robson over a, a period of time and he says that your team from 81 was the best team. Let's just play the clip and then you can react to that. I was at Ipswich a long time and I've probably built four teams, four different teams and four successful teams if you like but the 81 side in my opinion was the best side and um, it was the maturing of some of our homes, homespun players we bought well with Mariner and the two Dutch boys were excellent buys, Murant and Tyson. You know, and the development of Gates and Walk and Burley um, and Beatty. We bought well in Hunter, our centre half. Uh, Cooper was, uh, our goalkeeper was uh, uh, underestimated. Very cheap purchase, I think £23,000. So, we, you know, we bought well, uh, never made a mistake and had this um, youth policy which paid dividends. The boys of 81, the team that won the UEFA Cup, was his favourite team. And Was that the way you saw it, Russell? Um, <clears throat> certainly did. I think he, he built a side when he first got there. Uh, and then probably the one just prior to getting the team together for the 78 Cup final, they were... Uh, a good bunch of players, Brian Hamilton, David Johnson, uh, 
that era. Uh, Lloyd Sibyl obviously overlapped, and I think Paul Cooper overlapped into the the '78 squad, really, uh, if we can call it that. Um, but prior to that, the team of the the early mid '70s, Ray Crawford's team, prior to that, were very strong sides. I know Ray Crawford didn't learn Bobby Rawson, but um, I think what Sir Bobby did, he managed to work his own formula formula out of how best to put a side together. And he will he will tell people that, you know, he had a very balanced side in that 1981 squad. Uh, the defence was very good. Um, the midfield was very solid. And the front players uh, could all score goals. Um, but also, he liked players to play well with the players next to them. So myself and Terry Butcher formed quite a nice partnership. If Kevin Beattie was playing, he was easy to play alongside, whether he played left back or centre half or whether Terry played left back or if Millsy played left back or right back. It was a case of all the jigsaw pieces fitting snugly together. Johnny Walk was our defensive midfield player, so he had a role to play in front of us. <laughs> Most of the time, he was at the other, the other end of the pitch scoring the goals, but he was our defensive midfield player. Um, but he was never he was never in the wrong place at the wrong time, Walkie. A very, very astute uh, footballing brain. And the whole side was just like one big jigsaw that really fitted well together. Not great individuals. They weren't bad, but we were stronger as a unit together than we were on our own. I mean, me as a, as a football fan, I mean, Ipswich Town had a, a fantastic football team that you can still remember today, the whole 11 or the, the whole squad. And I'm just wondering, Malcolm, as a fan, you obviously remember these times well. And uh, I know you, you're obviously a big fan of, you were a big fan of Kevin Beattie, running the Kevin Beattie Foundation. How did you, uh, how do you remember the team? I was only 19 years old, so I was a very lucky uh, lad, really, because today the youngsters haven't seen any glory at all. Whereas at 19, I was able to basically have the, the joy of going to, you know, what ships we should places that I'd never been before, like, you know, Cologne and Etienne, and just basically going around Europe and watching town climb up the table, um, get all the way to the semi final of the FA Cup where we sadly lost. But, you know, it's just it was just a great time to be a fan. Literally the, the team was to me was one of the best teams or it is the best team, sorry, that I think I've ever witnessed. Not just um you know, it's rich, but actually in football in them days, you know, the, the two Dutchmen came in and they were just a breath of fresh air to football as well, I think. You know, we had Ricky Villier and Aussie Ideas, but when these two Dutch boys came over, you know, I just thought it brought a freshness to, to, to football and, um, yeah, it's a fantastic time to be a fan. I, I can't emphasise how great it was, especially fairly where it's which are today. And every one of those players, as Russell said, they just were superb in their own ability. Everybody just seemed to know what they were doing. Yeah, I think we we focused on playing well ourselves more than worrying about what the opposition were going to be trying to do to stop us. Um, and we thought we had a good formation, a good style of football. We were very fit as well. Um, I think a lot of people don't give us the credit for how fit and resilient we were through that season. Um, but we had a, a, a unique, in those days, a unique way of playing with Eric Gates, just playing off front two. We had a target man with Paul Manor. We had a runner to get in behind with Alan Brazil. They could score goals. Muir and Tyson scored goals from midfield. Walkie scored goals. Terry Butcher proved his value at um, the other end of the pitch as well, scoring very valuable goals, especially the one against uh, Cologne. Um, so we, we were lucky. We, we had quite a unique um, setup, really, as a team. Oh, I never thought we'd, we'd get to the end. I mean, I, it was a round-by-round round situation. Knockout football, you know, one game at a time. Um, uh, Arasolanka were easy at home, 5-1 I think, John Walk got four goals. But away from home, we were, we were on a dicey wicket for, for some part of the game, we were losing 3-0. I, I was, what was I, I was 22 at the time. And 
when we talk back to games like this and situations in these sorts of games, that's when uh, people like your captain become very, very important on the pitch. And Mick Mills would lead by example, but he would also have a word in your ear if he thought you were just losing a little bit of control. And there's nothing more important than the result for the team. How you did individually was came secondary. You know, you had to do your bit for the team first and foremost. Well, I can't control what they can do. That's, that's obviously absolutely sure. But I can control our attitude and the way we will behave and the way we will play our game. And obviously strict discipline is required. Uh, walking away from scenes, not getting involved in punches and, and reckless tackling, which obviously will go on in the match out there. If we play a good, open, sporting, but tough British game, we'll get out of it all right, and we should see them out of the competition. And one thing has got a little bit fiery. We knew we got enough players on the pitch that could handle themselves physically. You know, we, like I said, we were a fit, strong side, and we, we didn't mind mixing it a little bit. Um, but first and foremost, it was getting the job done and let everything else look after itself. Concentrate on doing the job. Get your head down, look after yourself, and don't get involved in any unnecessary uh, unnecessary altercations. Sounds simple. It does indeed. <laughs> uh, second second round, uh, you played against Bohemians of Prague, and uh, there's a little clip that we're going to play now from Bobby Robson. I'd been to see them play, and uh, I like the Czechs. I think they're good footballers, tough, durable, good technique. Um, we won three 0 at home. We were two up with about five minutes to go, and got a free kick. And I made a tactical change. I brought on Beatty um, immediately. He was very strong, had this powerful left foot. We got a free kick just outside the box, and Beatty rammed it home, which gave us a three 0 result. That actually, that goal actually got us through because we lost the away tie in Prague. Very difficult conditions, absolutely freezing, minus four degrees. Uh, and we lost 2-0, but on aggregate, got through 3-2. So again, it was close. Bobby Robson talks about a tactical change when he brought uh, Kevin Beatty off the bench to score that third goal. And that was obviously a, a turning point. And it proved the pivotal goal because it ended up being the one that decided the, the two legs because you won 3-2 on aggregate. Yeah, tough game, you know, and thankfully Kevin, as we said, you know, had a, a value at both ends of the pitch. And... Uh, it just proves a point these days when you, when you watch the team play that they are so short of goal scorers, not only up front, but from all areas of the pitch. Kevin, I think everybody knew what Kevin was about. Kevin would always come on the pitch and give you 110%, whether it was for 10 minutes of the game, 90 minutes of the game, 120 minutes of the game. Awesome player, awesome character. And... Somebody that you could count on that would step up when you needed him. And Malcolm, I think you've got a, a special memory of something that Kevin told you about that particular goal. Yeah, Kevin um, basically told me the two goals that he was always telling me about was one that was his favourite when um, Ipswich beat Manchester United away in the FA Cup 1 0, and it was his goal. But he said the most important goal he feels he scored for Ipswich Town was against Bohemians um, when he came on as a substitute and scored in the 85th minute. Uh, they actually won 3 0 on the first leg, but because they lost 2 0 on the second leg, that he feels that as the, the goal that got them through 3 2 on aggregate. And so he, he's always classed that as his most important goal for the club. Yeah, it's always more difficult to play European ties, two legged ties, having to play the home leg first. Because you, you've got to try and you got to try and build a lead to, to go away with. Uh, and at the same time, you've got to make sure that you don't concede any goals. Uh, and that sounds easy. We, we found that the easy bit was scoring goals at home. I mean, we got five against Salonika at home, three against Bohemians. We, we get rattled in another five against Bitsu Loss. But these were all first-legged games of a two-legged affair. So... Uh, like you say, we were able to take good, strong leads away from home. I think the only tie we had when we were playing away first was St. Etienne. Yeah. Um, so we did our high scoring there, thankfully. <laughs> 
I'm just going to play a clip now from uh, Bobby Robson talking about that Widzer Lodz game because I think the standout thing about that game was that they were really a little bit cocky, to be honest, because they'd just beaten Manchester United. And Bobby says that uh, the other manager wanted to bet him. We threw to round three, and next was the Polish team. Yes. You're feeling more confident at this stage? Well, we're feeling more comfortable, but they, in the previous round, they'd knocked out Manchester United. And um, I spoke to Dave Sexton about them, and, you know, he warned me, and they'd had two tough games, two narrow results, but lost. So, you know, they, they come to us, and I think they underestimated us. Because I remember stupid conversations with, with the coach before the match, who actually wanted to bet me with money on the result. And I said, in English pounds? He said, no, Polish. I said, no, I don't take Polish money. But he actually wanted to have a bet. I, first time ever in my life, a coach from the opposition has actually wanted to have a, a, a money bet on a, on a result, and I couldn't believe it. And I think he thought, you know, they've beaten Manchester United. They will demolish Ipswich. He wanted to bet that my team's going to beat yours, yeah. and he was so surprised that this had happened. And he, he said it was really, a, it was kind of a sign of the arrogance really of the other guy because he thought we're only little Ipswich town. But uh, you, you kind of sorted them out on the pitch, didn't you? We we certainly did. Um, I went down to watch them the night before the game. I went down to Portman Road to watch them training on the pitch, and they had a, a lad who was going to be playing up front for them called Boniek. It was fantastic centre forward and I thought well if we can see what he's like in training we might get a little idea of what we're going to have to contend with you know come the you know the game the following night so we sat there eagerly to see what sort of training they were going to be doing and what part Boniek was going to be playing in it and he spent the whole evening in goal they had a little fiver side, he played in goal. They had a shooting practice session and he went in goal. So that was a lot of good, wasn't it? <laughs> One of the things that stands out for me about that team is you could you could kind of you can still remember the team now because in those days you didn't have big squads and you were going for the you were actually going for a treble and uh, in the end you almost won nothing, but you all came down to the final game. But I mean how hard was it for you as a squad to be playing so many games? I think you played sixty six games that season. Yeah, sixty six uh, competitive first team games. It was a lot. I think it worked out that we played one game every four point three days for the whole of the season. Um, and it was uh it was tough. It was very tough, but it was uh it was better than training, um, but it started to catch up with us towards the end of the season, you know, when we were playing um, big, important games with a sort of a small squad. It was very difficult to keep on top of everything. Um, I'm just trying to think, I mean, people like Kevin Steggles came in and played a couple of games for us, and it wasn't as if these players were coming in on a regular basis to play games. You know, he he didn't feature a lot during the season, but suddenly got called upon in a couple of the European ties to play a full 90 minutes. And he did that very, very well. But it was a case of get your best team on the pitch, even if one of the two of the players were not quite 100% fit. And I think these days, the modern players don't have that attitude or are not allowed to show that attitude because the clubs are very protective about the players, the medical staff are very protective about the players, um, more worried about them, you know, missing three or four games if they did try and play with an injury. You know, in our days, we didn't have that many players. So it was a case of, you know, if you declare yourself fit and you think you can get through 90 minutes, then that was it. And it was, it was tough. It was disappointing as well mentally when we got knocked out of the the FA Cup um, by people that won the, the game last night against PSG. Um, and good luck to them for the European Championship final. Uh, that was a that was a difficult one because that was also Kevin's last game for his Malcolm, wasn't it? You know, he well, ended up going up to, yeah, broke his arm and um, and we lost out there. Then we had a bit of a dip in, in form um, in the league. Uh, and if you, if you look at it, we, there was a long gap 
from December till I think it's the middle of March when the European game started again. And a large uh, chunks of that time, we were winning games regularly and consistently. And then all of a sudden it got a little bit compressed and we were playing like eight games a month in March, eight games in April. And and these were big games, you know, massive games. We, we're trying to keep in touch at the top of the table. Uh, we're looking at um, quarterfinal against Antetian. We're looking at semi-final double leg games um, with Cologne. And it was just, I think it was just a bit of an overload that caught us out. And Aston Villa, they got knocked out of everything early on and only played, was it 46, 48 games and used about 14 players. I want to ask you about the St Etienne Etien game in a moment, but first I just want to get a reaction from, from Malcolm because you as a fan, how nerve-wracking was it for you as a fan to see you go so close to, to a treble and then perhaps worry that maybe you'll end up with nothing? I have to say, I know Ross has said it was a hectic time for the players, but it was a hectic time for the fans as well because um, I remember the Cologne one, especially because we had, we had Cologne, if I remember right, we had Cologne at home and then we had Norwich on a, I think it was a bank holiday Monday. And then we had to shoot out to Cologne again, you know, the second leg, I think on the Wednesday or the second, I went out on a Tuesday day after the Norwich game to, for yeah. the game on a Wednesday. So, so it was it, yeah. like, yeah, yeah, we, I was literally coming out on Cow Road, having a night's sleep, then getting the bus and the ferry up to Germany for the game. So it was not a stop, but at the time, maybe yeah. the players realised more than we did because the team was so successful. I generally thought the town were going to literally be the first team to do the travel. I couldn't see anyone touching that team. I agree what Russell was saying. Well, I don't agree because I wasn't there, but what he was saying about the team running out of legs and steam, maybe that was the case. But when I look at that team, and I've got to be honest, not because I'm biased, Aston Villa weren't the best team in that league. It's which was. And yeah. to come close, and we even beat Villa in that run as well at the end. We even beat Villa Villa Park 2 1. I really generally believe that we we're going to win out all three. And, you know, to lose to Man City was bitter for me purely because, you know, Kevin broke his arm and. It all seemed to go wrong. Powell scored a goal, and I don't think City was a better team. Maybe, honest. But you know, like like Russell, Russell was the expert. He was a player, so he knows. You know, maybe they were running out of steam, and it was a very small squad as well. But for the fans, it was hectic. But I'll tell you one thing: I love to be hectic again and be enjoyable as that again because yeah. that was a fantastic to be a fan. Yeah. Fantastic time to be a fan. Malcolm, do you remember back in December? You know, we played on the twenty sixth and the twenty seventh. We played two games in two days. Yeah, yeah, no, I know. They, they don't... You know, but that's how it was in those no. days. Yeah, yeah. Well, the smaller squad as well. Yeah, yeah, smaller yeah, squad. Well, you can't, you can't use any, and you couldn't use five substitutes either, could you? You only used <laughs> two, I think. <laughs> you know, you need two. So, we only needed one. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. Kevin. I'm going I'm to play a quote from uh, Bobby Robson because he talks about exactly that. I think I can't remember how many games it was, but I think it might have even been three and five days, but he explains it in this little quote I'm going to play now. Well, then we drew the German team, FC Cologne, and it went, you know, German football is tough and difficult to beat and they don't give anything away, they defend well. And by this time, it's getting towards the end of our season, you know, and we're on a short uh, crop of players, if you like, and one or two little injuries are occurring. Uh, uh, a little bit of tiredness coming in because you know we were successful in Europe and doing well in the league, doing well in the FA Cup, and I knew you know there was going to be a bit of a mountain to climb. It was a tough game at home. We won one nil, very not very much in it. We were slightly better than they were, but I knew we had a, a lot, an awful lot to do in the second leg, and the second leg was at Easter, around about the Easter period. And I remember we played on the Saturday. We played on the Easter Monday against Norwich and we actually went to Cologne immediately after that game to play on the Wednesday. So it was our third game in five days. I mean, can you believe that? Playing the semi-final of a UEFA Cup in April, third game in five days. We didn't train the day of the match. In fact, we went to an amusement park. I remember it well, just to lift spirits and let the players enjoy, enjoy it and forget about football until two hours before the kickoff. And it worked wonders. Do you remember that little uh, trip, uh, Russell? I do. I mean, it was it was it was a bit farcical, wasn't it? Because you know we we played Norwich, um, 
I think straight after the game, rather than coming back down the 120 to Ipswich, it was uh, around the town centre to the airport and jump on a plane and we're, we're going to nip off to Cologne. Um, and this is at a busy time of the season. It's been very, very hectic, March, March and April time. So we're now looking at the end of the end of April. And I think Sir Bobby and Bobby Ferguson and Charlie Woods just said, listen, you know, there's no point training, no point trying to tra train when we get out there. So the next problem was trying to keep us amused. Usually we managed to keep ourselves quite amused. <laughs> but uh, they took charge of this entertainment um, and there wasn't a bar in sight. You got to the final and uh, it's that whole pressure point about is the season all going to be ending without a trophy? How desperate were you to win a trophy? Here's a little clip from Bobby Robson. You were in danger of not winning anything at all, but you came to the final against AZ67. Did you feel that you had a lot of energy left or was it just a psychological edge of having to win something? Yeah, it was, it was the psychological edge of having to win something. Players you know, had, knew they played well, knew that they were the best team in England, were, were very conscious to win something, were very, um, you know, had great mental force and, 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 and desire to, to finish the season off and this one wasn't going to elude us. Okay, so Bobby was basically saying you were determined that you were not going to end up with nothing. How, how are you feeling in the, in the players' camp, Russell? <laughs> well, you can be as determined as you like, but, you know, you've still got to put a performance together, haven't you? Um, as, uh, as mentally tough as you know you're going to have to be, it's uh, how tough are you collectively? And again, we had the, the first leg at home. So we knew we had to try and keep a, a clean sheet and get a and get a, a bit of a buffer. Get you know one, two, maybe three goals if we were lucky. We managed to get the three, so that gave us a a, a bit of a buffer, uh, a good solid performance. Um, but what we what we had found through the experience of playing the, the European campaign was that. A lot of the European sides didn't travel away from home that well. But when you went to their home ground, they were like a different team completely. So we'd seen that at, at Lotz, we'd seen that um, uh, in Salonika, we'd seen that all, all the way through the competition, really. The only time it was around the other way, I think, was the um, Sintetian. We'd seen it in Cologne. Cologne weren't great at Portman Road. Um, but we only scored one goal against them, but we managed to, to keep a clean sheet out in Cologne. So, you know, and obviously grabbed another goal. So to go into the second leg with a three-goal lead was fantastic, but we knew the second leg was going to be extremely tough. We knew it would be a different side completely that took to the pitch as far as AZ Altmar were concerned in that second leg. Um, I wouldn't say they were a push-over in the first leg, because they had some fantastic players there. But second leg is a different kettle of fish. And I think one of the worst things that happened from our point of view in the second leg is that we scored the early goal. Because that enabled um, AZ Altmar to throw caution to the wind from very early on in the game. And they certainly did throw caution to the wind. I must admit, watching it, and I remember the game, I, I did feel that when they got it back to 5-4, it was all over for Ipswich. And you must have had to dig really deep to get yourselves over the line. Um, I think it was a bit of Fergie time, just hoping that the ref would blow the whistle early. Um, we, we got a second goal in the, in the second leg, so that, that gave us a, a little bit of a... A breather, and that was the goal that made the difference. But again, it just meant that you know, Ace and Almar had nothing to lose, and they were a strong side. Johnny Metgod, spell boss at the back, Johnny Rep, um, Keys Keys up front, uh, good players, you know. And when and when everything just keeps going their way, which it, it seemed to, you know, we could have had a couple of decisions on things in and around the 18 yard box, but. 
we never got those. The momentum wasn't with us. But uh, again, we had some experienced players on the pitch. We've got the two Dutch lads there. Uh, we've got Millsy, we've got Paul Cooper in goal, Mano up front. Um, so wise old heads really pulled us through that. And I'm wondering, as a fan, how did you celebrate? How did the Ipswich Town fans celebrate? I was about 19 years old in Amsterdam. I couldn't think of anything better, personally. Um, yeah, we had a few beers afterwards. The main square was just blue and white. I'm sure the bar owners loved it because obviously with English culture and drinking I'm sure they took a few pounds that night and um, it was that good as um, I, I just well I obviously fell asleep with some top of some barge boat and I just remember waking up here in the morning thinking oh, I've got to rush back to my hotel get my bag packed and get the ferry home so uh, yeah at 19 for me it was a fantastic time Amsterdam Ipswich Town winning the European Trophy you know, it's what dreams are made of, and um, you know, I, I, I loved it every moment of it. I'm a very lucky guy, I think. I really do think that. I think I saw you down on that barge. <laughs> well, okay, <laughs> you should have woke me up then. <laughs> <laughs> it must have been a great celebration for the players as well. I mean, uh, obviously, had a civic reception when you came home, and it must have been fantastic to do something for Ipswich fans and Ipswich, the town. It was great, it was wonderful. Um, I was lucky in that I was on the edge of the 78 squad where I played four rounds of the 1978 FA Cup winning team. Um, so you witness those celebrations in 78 and to see them again in 81 when we got home, oh, fantastic. I mean, the Corn Exchange, it's had two magnificent days there, um, seeing everybody standing on the roof, 100 foot in the air, at the top of the lamppost, hanging out windows, um, and completely packed. Great crowd, great days. I mean, it's obviously not the best time at the moment for being an Ipswich Town fan, but I think we've had this shock to the system with the uh, Super League. And I think when you look back at the history and you see what a great team Ipswich Town had, and you were the best team in England at that time, there's no doubt about it. Uh, and it really does underline the fact that we have to keep alive the, the football pyramid for teams like Ipswich Town who are going through not the best times at the moment. Wouldn't you say so, uh, Russell? I, I'd agree with you there, John. Um, I think there's been a fair bit of damage just done with the Premier League. I think it's lost. we've lost some of the uh, heart of the sport. Um, I know we've had the problems with COVID this this season, but you know we've had um, issues with the the, the replays, uh, replays, decision making, VAR, this, that, and the other. It's. I think there's a lot of pleasure being taken away from the game and out of the game with VAR. Some decisions go for you, some go against you. When it was just a referee's decision. Some decisions went for you, some went against you. So in the long term, I don't see that there's going to be any difference long term. Yes, goal line technology to decide when the ball's gone completely over the line, fine. I, I can handle that. That's, a, that's just a bleep of a button. But when you have a group of referees sitting in London somewhere analysing the referee uh, who's controlling the game, they look at VAR and everything stops and everybody waits and nobody knows whether they're coming or going or whether the goal is going to be given or not. And it's, I think it's farcical. And the European Super League was just greed. People getting very greedy, only thinking of themselves. And if that had gone ahead, then those big clubs would have spent more money having bigger squads because they were going to have to have a bigger squad to to compete alongside the games that they were playing in the Premier League or whatever league they were playing in. They'd need more players and the players would just get richer and richer and the cost of watching the games would skyrocket. It seems to me football, I'm a, I've been watching my team for over 50 years and football's all about dreams and uh, I like to try and end up on a, on, a, on a positive note. I mean, we're looking back 40 years ago when Ipswich Town had their greatest ever team you won the UEFA Cup. Is that... You're both fans. I mean, I know as a former player, I think when, you, when you've been a player for a team like Ipswich, you become a fan when you finish playing. And uh, do you still have that dream that Ipswich can get back to a higher level? 
in the not too distant future? I, I do. Um, I've got a lot of time for the the new owners with uh, how they're going about the business at the moment. Um, one thing, I, one thing I do miss, and this is just harping back to your previous point, really, is not being able to name most of the teams in the Premier League anymore. You know, when we played, you could you could name the, the Derby County eleven, the, the Newcastle United eleven, the Manchester United's best eleven, the Liverpool's best eleven, and like, we were favourite team to a lot of supporters who to this day would still be able to name you probably the 78 team and the 1981 team. You can't do that at the top level now. Um, so I think we've lost a bit there. And how about you, Malcolm? Do you, you obviously, I saw some sort of social media today. It doesn't matter if you're down, up or you're down, you still follow the town and uh, you must uh, dream that you're going to be back sooner or later. I had a Leeds fan on the other, on the other day, and he said that everybody in the old days, because of the Dutchmans, you know, the, the Murans and Tysons, yeah. Russell, Marin, Brazil, because of the style of football, the manager as well. So it wasn't just Ipswich fans. We were everybody's favourite second team. And I still want to be out there playing Norwich, and I still want Ipswich to be out there playing Man United, and I still want to be going to Anfield. You know, I still want to be going to European teams. Yes, I'm talking a long, long way ahead. But... If we don't have them dreams, and don't have them goals, then what's the point of waking up on a morning? What's the point? Malcolm, Ipswich Town used to have a style about it, a style about the way they played. They had an identity, how they played the football, how the club conducted itself. Um, go back to the Cobolds and the example they set off the pitch and not necessarily on the pitch. They let Bobby Robson deal with the football side of things. They made a made sure everything was okay in the background. And the new owners hopefully will reflect on that, um, reflect on what's been achieved in the past. And it's not all about what goes on on the football pitch at the moment of the football club. It, it needs a, a big overhaul, uh, needs a lick of paint. Um, because what you see on the outside is a reflection of what's going on inside the football club at the moment. And Portman Road is deteriorating and the football has been deteriorating on the inside as well. Now, hopefully, they've got the new manager to correct things. Um, you look at the results lately and I think a lot of people will... Uh, keeping the fingers crossed that this is the right appointment um and time will tell on that one you know really we want to get the season finished uh see what's going to happen see how many players is going to keep sell give away um or whatever see what sort of squad they can uh put together for the start of next season because you know we have to remember it is the old third division and Ipswich Town have uh, been in there for two seasons too long now. Yeah, definitely. Just before we wrap up, I'd just like you to remind us, uh, Malcolm, how do people contribute to the uh, to the fundraising that you... Uh, I know you've got a signed shirt from uh, Russell. How do people uh, get a chance of winning it? Uh, well, a signed shirt from Russell is um, an Escape to Victory shirt, which is also their 40th anniversary film. But that's up, that's up for auction. But for the raffle, uh, they contact um, Kevin Beatty Foundation on Twitter. Or you can actually email Malcolm, M A L C O L M, at kevinbeattyfoundation.co.uk. And then we will provide you details of how to purchase tickets and how to take part in the auction as well. As I say, we've got 30 prizes, all its town prizes, you know, shirts, books, canvases. Fantastic, the, the whole lot. And um, yeah, and all the money will go to the Bobby Robson Foundation. Great cause then, uh, Russell. Yeah, I better put my hand in my pocket, hadn't I? No in mind, look how win my shirt back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, it's a great, great foundation, isn't it? The Sir Bobby Robson Foundation, you know, and it's wonderful to see what Malcolm has been doing in memory of Kevin Beatty. Um, so... Well done with that, Malcolm, and well done with everything you're doing. And you just want people to get behind 
people who've got the energy to keep things going like like this. So uh, every penny for the Bobby Robson Foundation, um, cancer care, cancer help, cancer research. Um, he was fantastic in the way he battled his own uh, war with cancer and uh, it's helping a lot of people to do the same thing. I'd like to thank you both for uh, joining us on this uh, fabulous show. And uh, it's, you know, I don't want to sound like an old, an old dinosaur, but, you know, football for me was better in the old days and uh, Ipswich Town certainly were better in the old days. And I hope it's not too long before you have another team to be proud of. And thank you both for joining me. Thank you, John. Thank Cheers. You. Kind words. Thank, thank you. Cheers. Thank you, John. Thank you, Russell. My pleasure.